Okay, so good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Zussman, and I am a senior researcher at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Hayama, Japan. And I am delighted to be here today to serve as the MC for our side event webinar entitled A One Health Approach to Regulating Ocean Microplastics, Translating Advocacy into Action. Uh, this side event for the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development is being organized by representatives from the government of Japan and the government of France, uh, in particular, the Embassy of Japan in Thailand, the Embassy of France in Thailand, as well as the Ministry of Environment Japan, in collaboration with the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. And uh, we have a, a very nice agenda on a very timely topic, especially uh, given some of the recent events coming out of the uh, United Nations Environment and Assembly on plastics. Um, and we do have a very full agenda to this evening. So what I'd like to do without further ado is bring us into that agenda. And I'd like to start off with uh, some opening remarks um, uh, via video from His Excellency, Mr. Kazuya Nashida, uh, and uh, His Excellency is the Ambassador Extraordinary and a Plenipotentiary of Japan to the Kingdom of Thailand. Uh, and so I'd like to now move to the, the video. Um, could somebody facilitate that for us, please? Dear participants, good evening from Bangkok. It is a great honor for me to welcome all of you to this side event and One Health approach on microplastic in the ocean, translating advocacy into action. This is our second consecutive year that Japan is co-organizing this type of event with France at the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. And I think I thank the government of France for continuous partnership. Plastic marine litter is one of the most serious emerging issue of today. Japan surrounded by the ocean is keenly aware of this issue, not only for a great uh, liking of seafoods, but also the fact that marine ecosystem is heavily affected by plastic pollution in the world ocean and rivers. No country in the Asian Pacific region can avoid this issue. It is estimated that over 8 million tons of plastic waste flow into the ocean each year, and a significant amount of the waste comes from the Asia and the Pacific region. Without effective countermeasures, the amount of plastic waste in the ocean will outweigh fish by 2050. The plastic waste has multiple adverse effects on marine ecosystems. You might have seen a picture of a whale which died from having ingested massive amounts of plastic waste, or an image of a plastic straw stabbing the nose of a turtle. Plastic waste has another effect after it breaks into small pieces called microplastic. It is eaten by small fishes and thereafter through the successive links of food chain. The tiny microscopic uh, particles cause significant harm to other animal species, including human beings. As these issues are relatively new in the history of our mother nature, we have uh, we have to be alert to them with the adequate and accurate information. At the G20 summit in Osaka in 2019, the leaders shared a common global vision called the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision, which aims to reduce additional pollution by marine plastic litter but to zero by 2050. And as a po positive step in this direction, a resolution on an international legally binding agreement about your plastic pollution was adopted at the UNEA 5.2 earlier this month. I am convinced that this political commitment will enhance our countermeasures on plastic marine pollution. At today's side event, we will have experts with different backgrounds and knowledges. And I believe that their presentations and discussions will deepen our understanding of the effect microplastic have our, to our health and will suggest possible effective measures on this issue for the participants. I hope that today's event will help us 
realize our political and social commitments and will lead to solving the marine plastic problem in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those uh, timely remarks, uh, Ambassador Nashida. And uh, I think uh, highlighting not only the UNEA progress, but also this uh, Saka Blue Vision pointing us in a good direction. Um, and now I would like to turn uh, the virtual uh, dais over to um, our colleague from the uh, 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, from the, the, the uh, Deputy Head of uh, Mission and Deputy Permanent Re Representative to uh, UNSCAP, uh, Mr. Remy Lambert. Uh, Mr. Lambert, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Nashida, Honorable Delegates, Distinguished Speakers. Uh, so my name is Rémi Lambert and uh, Deputy Head of Mission uh, in the Embassy of France, which is also the permanent representation of France to UNESCAP in Bangkok. I'm very honored to participate to this side event uh, jointly organized by Japan, uh, France and the UNESCAP in the frame of the NAMES Asia Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development. It's a great pleasure to renew this initiative with our Japanese partners. This continuation of our joint event reflects our common ambition to engage on global issues over the long term in the region. All of us are involved in the emerging challenges that affect the oceans, but also potentially the human health. To that respect, I want to emphasize France's commitment to work under the One Health approach which tackles the interaction between human, animal, and environmental health. In Asia Pacific, an area where this One Health approach is particularly useful and important is the regulation of microplastic in oceans. While the plastic pollution in the ocean is not confined to Asia, it is particularly striking here with the five countries in the region alone dumping more plastic into the oceans than the rest of the world. Global awareness has grown. We very much welcome the UN resolution adopted last month in Nairobi in favor of a multilateral agreement on plastics. At the national and regional level, it is our responsibility to endorse these dynamics through solution-based initiatives that strengthen our understanding and action on this issue. This is what we are determined to do with today's event. The issue of plastic pollution in the ocean and its governance is a priority of France action at the multilateral level. In collaboration with ESCAP, this embassy in Bangkok is actively supporting French and Thai research on marine pollution and other emerging pollutants to bring this technical expertise to the attention of policymakers. In 2020 and in 2021, together with ESCAP, France supported the training of high-level experts on this subject. More recently, French experts also contributed to the drafting of a policy brief on managing marine plastic debris in Asia and the Pacific. Last month, in the framework of its presidency of the Council of the European Union, France hosted the One Ocean Summit in Brest, west of France, to put the spotlight on the seas ahead of major, major international events this year, including the UN Ocean Conference scheduled in Lisbon next July. More than 100 countries attended the One Ocean Summit in Brest and undertook through the Brest commitments to work together swiftly and tangibly to put a stop to the degradation of the oceans. Since then, our embassy in Bangkok is continuing its commitment at a national and regional level through regular initiatives 
I mentioned the Women and the Oceans event organized on the 8th of March with the Asian Institute of Technology and the Alliance Francaise in Bangkok to celebrate women scientists empowerment in marine conservation. Today's event echoes all this initiative spirit along with experts from Southeast Asia and international agencies or experts from France whom I greet and thank for their participation present and discuss field experiences, past and ongoing projects, as well as solution-based initiatives. I would like to thank ESCAP for the opportunity offered to both Japan and France to share this original contribution and expertise to decision makers and other stakeholders. I also warmly thank our Japanese partners, the Ministry of Environment, the Institute for Global Environment Strategies, and the embassies of Jap in the Embassy of Japan to Bank in Bangkok, collaborating with France for the second year in a row for such a fruitful exchange. Finally, I want to thank the various international experts who came to enable the sharing of the latest science and the identification of practical policy options to address. And I wish you all a very successful and interesting side event Thank you very much. Haligato Gosaimas. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Lambert. And I think that gives us a, a really nice platform to begin uh, the uh, next section of our side event. And that next section is a panel discussion, which will be moderated by the a chief executive of IGES. Uh, and that is uh, Mr. Uh, Yasuo Takahashi and uh, Takahashi Shicho. I'd now like to turn the uh, floor over to you to moderate the panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Ericsson, for your kind introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to moderate this panel discussion tonight. Uh, from the opening remarks we just heard, we understand that Asia Pacific region can play an important role in solving the marine plastic issues. I think, and I also think that it is extremely timely to have this session today because of the recent historic outcome of the UNIA 5.2 to start the negotiation process for an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. I will be moderating this panel discussion with the aim that by the end of this session, we understand better the problems we face as well as the solutions to these problems. I'm here with four distinguished panelists who can talk about the problems and solutions to marine plastic pollution from different perspectives. I would like to introduce them now. First panelist, uh, Dr. Claire Lajoni. She is working for the French National Institute of Health and Med Medical Research at the LPED, Population Environment Development Laboratory. She investigates the interlinkage between biodiversity and health and their evolution due to global changes. Today, she will talk about the One Health approach and its link to microplastics in the ocean. The second speaker will be Dr. Shadar Agrawara. He is the head of Environment and Economy Integration Division of OECD Environment Directorate. His team recently published the Global Plastic Outlook. I look forward to hearing from him on the overview of the plastic problems and how they, they may be tackled. The next speaker will be Ms. Megu Tsuchimura from Pirika Incorporated from Japan. She is currently involved in microplastics countermeasures in Mekong River Basin for a UNEP project. She will shed light on this topic from the technical perspective, talking about the importance of looking at, the, at microplastics in rivers and monitoring microplastics pollution. Last but not least, we have Dr. Pierjan Bodandi, Associate Professor at the School of Law and Social Sciences, the University of South Pacific in Vanuatu. He is working with the International Marit Maritime Organization, or IMO. Today, he will talk about the ship-based marine plastic pollution and the regulations on that, highlighting the importance, important role of governance. Before starting the presentation, I'd like to explain about the Q&A session. If time allows, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. 
Therefore, I would like to invite the audience to use the Q&A box to submit your questions to the panelists. Without further introduction, I would like to start the panel. First, I would like to invite Dr. Claire Lajoni for your presentation. Are you muting, Claire? Claire, you are muting. Please deep. Okay, thank you, sorry. Sorry, um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the Japanese and French Embassy, as well as the Ministry of the Environment in Japan for the invitation. And uh, I want to present the interest of the One Health approach for the ocean and the question of microplastic. So first, um, the, sorry, can you see my screen? Yes, please. Yeah, okay, right. sorry. Uh, so the one health approach is interesting because it considers all together the animal health, the human health, and the health of the environment. Here, the health of the ocean, and uh, it calls for uh, sorry, it calls for um, an interdisciplinary approach and an uh, intersectoral approach. Uh, linking together biodiversity, climate change, geography, demography, and all the different aspects relating to health. So um, uh, the One Health approach is very high on the international agenda with the creation of the One Health high-level expert panel in 2020 during the Paris Peace Forum. And uh, the, pan the expert panel is composed uh, by 26 international experts with a broad range of technical knowledge, skills, and um, competencies relevant to the One Health. It is here to enhance coordination and collaboration among sectors and agency at different uh, decision-making level to provide um, policy-relevant scientific assessment and um, try to uh, tackle um, health crises arising from the human, animal, and ecosystem health, and to um, show the research gaps. Um, it is under the umbrella of the um, Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, the World Health Organization, and the United Nations Environment Program. And the point here is that um, that expert panel gave a definition of the One Health as an integrated unifying approach um, to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystems. And it recognizes the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants and the wider environment, here is the ocean, uh, as they are closely linked and interdependent. So when we speak about the ocean, we consider the ocean from the coastal areas to the deep sea with uh, many entropic activities like the use of pesticide in agriculture, um, the spread of drugs and antibiotics, the urbanization, the um, plastic litter, uh, overfishing, um, deep sea trolling or uh, deep sea bed mining. Um, this is the time of the decade of ocean science for uh, sustainable development, which started last year. And that decade calls for a good science uh, to inform policies, an increase of the knowledge of all the different stakeholders involved, the need to address pressing environmental issues such as climate change, biodiversity loss, marine pollution, marine pollution due to plastic, and the degradation of marine and coastal environment, and to find solutions to address the decline in ocean health. So here we have shown with a colleague, Pierre Mazega, last year that um, in the decades there, there is uh, th there are gaps between the, the content of the ocean decade as it is in the science we need for the ocean we want document and the one else research on the ocean. With um, the ocean is underrepresented in relation to One Health, 
uh, while um, the scientific research on One Health is barely connected to the UNOC ocean decade, which means that we need to make an effort to, to increase the dialogue between uh, science and, um, and policies. So there are examples anyway of uh, studies in relation to uh, the ocean, One Health and microplastics with uh, those articles presented here uh, on, for example, microplastics in sea turtles, marine mammals and humans published last year. And uh, another article, it's just an example, there are others, but on one health uh, perspective of the impact of microplastic on human, uh, animal and the environment. So it's to say that uh, the connection is very important to make between human health, um, wildlife, animals and ecosystem health. And uh, we need to know more about the data uh, of human exposure to microplastics. And um, uh, we need to inform the policymakers or, or of what could compose uh, a legislation on microplastic. And we need to go from science to political action. Uh, as, uh, as it has already been mentioned, the United Nations Environment Assembly adopted a resolution to end plastic pollution and to adopt an international legally binding instrument uh, on plastic pollution. And it, it includes microplastic. And um, the point is to study the specific impact of plastic pollution on the marine environment, as well as to consider altogether the full life cycle approach of the microplastics and to uh, take into account the national circumstances and uh, capabilities. So it goes from science to political action. And uh, we need also the jurist or legal scientists to, to do that, um, that bridge from science to political action. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire, for sharing with us the importance of One Health approach and also the interlinkage between science and political action. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Shadow Agrawala from OECD uh, to make your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Takahashi. And I'd like to thank IGES, uh, the government of Japan and the government of France uh, for uh, giving this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So uh, in, in the next few minutes, I'm going to give a broad overview of the plastics problem building on the global plastics outlook. And I'm going to pull some threads related specifically to the microplastics challenge, which is the focus of today's event. So we, we launched the global plastics outlook about three and a half weeks ago. And I'm just going to walk you through some of the findings. So the first major finding from the outlook is the remarkable increase in global plastics use since uh, we, we started measuring uh, how much we are producing in 1950, which was 2 million tons. Uh, we have increased global plastics production 230 times and it stood at 460 million tons in 2019. There was a small dip in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But again, the growth in plastics use has picked up again as economic activity has resumed. Now, one issue is, you know, what do we mean by 460 million tons? That's the weight of 45,500 Eiffel Towers. Uh, in terms of the rate of growth of plastics consumption, uh, it's grown 40% quicker than GDP over the past two decades. There's also a close link between plastics uh, production and consumption and the climate change problem and the plastics life cycle accounted for 1.8 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in 2019. And in terms of uh, how much we consume in different parts of the world, these are just averages across OECD countries. Each person in the OECD consumes 156 kilograms of new plastic per year and the number is 39 kilograms uh, per capita per year in non-OECD countries. Now, as a result of 
this plastics consumption, the other side of the coin is obviously plastics waste. And in 2019, uh, the world produced 353 million tons of plastic waste. Now, this is what happens according to our calculations to uh, uh, plastic waste. Uh, on the right hand side in blue, light blue and turquoise, you have the waste which is entering the formal waste management system. So what you have in dark blue is how much is the percentage of waste in different parts of the world, which is landfilled. In light blue, you have how much of it is incinerated. And in turquoise, you have how much of it is recycled. On the other hand, on the left hand side, you have the percentage of plastic waste, which is mismanaged or uncollected litter. Now, if we look at uh, the Asia region, um, sorry, I'm just so Japan and Korea, you can see there's very little mismanaged and uncollected uh, waste. Uh, there's a significant share, which is landfill. The, a bulk of the waste is incinerated. And then you have recycling, uh, which is close to the OECD average. Uh, then if you look at China, there's a lot more mismanaged and uncollected litter. And you have the picture on the formal waste management system on the right. This is the picture of India with even more mismanaged and uncollected waste. And uh, on, on the right hand side, you have the formal waste management system. And this is the picture for other countries in Asia, um, uh, where, uh, which is somewhat similar to what you see for India. Now, uh, the plastics life cycle, uh, despite all advances in recycling, is only 8% circular in terms of material recovery. Uh, of the waste we produce, only 8% of that eventually makes back into uh, the economy as secondary plastics. This is the picture in terms of plastic flows. So in 2019, we consumed 460 million tons. Most of that plastic came from fossil fuels and most of it was primary plastic. Secondary plastics were only 29 million tons. Um, we produced 353 million tons of waste of which we only collected 55 million tons for recycling. And even some of that was lost due to recycling losses and only 29 million tons made it way back. But if you look at the amount which is landfill, that's significantly higher. Incinerated is also higher than what is collected for recycling. And then you have this part which is mismanaged and littered. And this is about the leakage of plastics in the environment. So you have this estimate of microplastics leakage from the use phase of plastics, and that's 2.7 million tons according to our calculations. And, and, and then you have different sources of macroplastic leakage in the aquatic environment, in the terrestrial environment, through open pit burning and, and, and dump sites. Uh, our estimates are 22 million tons of plastics, both macro and micro, leaked into the environment in 2019. Now, looking at the shares, 88% uh, of the plastics which leaked into the environment were macroplastics, and then you have 12% uh, which were microplastics. And, and these are the contributions for different sources. So for microplastics, uh, you see transport related microplastics were 4% of the 12%. Uh, microplastics dust, another 3%. Wastewater sludge, another 3%. And, and, and then you have some of the other sources. So Asia contributes almost half of the macroplastic leakage and slightly less than half of the microplastics leakage if you look at the global picture. Now, just talking about the fate of plastics in the aquatic environments, uh, we talk a lot about uh, marine plastic litter. Uh, the outlook also highlights the importance of what's happening in rivers and lakes. Our estimates are 2.7 million tons uh, uh, of plastics enter rivers each year, and 3.1 million tons are sinking into river and lake beds. Uh, we also have a share of plastics, 1.7 million tons, transported to the coastal ocean surface. And eventually, uh, you have 1.5 million tons of plastics floating close to the ocean's shoreline, then sinking into seabeds and so on. And the accumulated stock of plastics in the oceans is about 30 million tons. But we have a lot more, almost 100 million tons, uh, which is accumulated in rivers. So what are some of the key levers for intervention? And this is my final slide. So I'm going to highlight some of the key levers we discuss for all plastics first, and then talk a little bit about microplastics. So we need 
to do a lot more to strengthen markets for recycled plastics. Uh, we also need to boost innovation uh, for more circular plastics. Uh, we need to scale up international financing and cooperation. And so this would be financing for better waste management uh, in many parts of the developing world. But it is also about harmonizing standards related to product design and many other things where we need international coordination and cooperation. And finally, we need to increase the ambition of domestic policies, both in the OECD countries and in the developing world. Now, specifically with regard to microplastics, uh, there are very key uh, information gaps, which are a key barrier to policy action. So we need to better assess uh, the risks posed by microplastics. We also need to assess and compare mitigation intervention. So what we can do at the level of the design of products, to reduce uh, uh, products containing microplastics, but also how we can reduce leakage of microplastics in the use phase. And if the microplastics leak, then what we can do in terms of uh, mitigation technologies and end of pipe solutions. We also need to do a lot more to exploit co-benefits with other policy objectives. For example, sustainable mobility and what are the links to microplastic leakage from tires. And finally, we need to consider additional policy measures for unintentional release of microplastics. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Shada, for your uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation on the uh, recent critical uh, global trend of plastic waste and also suggesting some uh, potential key areas for intervention. Now I'd like to turn to Ms. Megu Tsuchimura uh, for your presentation. Hi. So can you share this screen? Or can you can you see this screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for introduction and inviting giving us uh, such a wonderful opportunity. And my name is Meg Tsuchimura, consultant of Pirika. Uh, Pirika means beautiful in Ainu, one of Japan's indigenous languages. Today, I'm going to talk about microplastic monitoring and surveys regarding plastic leakage. So this is the content I will present today. First of all, I will do an introduction of Pirika. Pirika is an environmental startup company created in 2011 to solve environmental problems with the power of science and technology. Our first target is to minimize the leakage of litter to the national environment. So far, Pirika has been approaching the problem of waste from three angles. These are picking up litter, surveying litter on land, and surveying waste such as microplastics in rivers and oceans. So today, I will focus on microplastic survey, which is called Albatos. And the goal of our survey using Albatos is to create solutions about microplastic leakage. From previous research, we knew that the ocean is where the data gathers in the end. And even if you find the microplastics in the ocean, it is hard to identify the original product or which river it came from. And both makes it very hard to conduct further research on microplastics. So as Dr. Agrawala from OECD mentioned, rivers are key pathway and sink for aquatic leakage, we decided to do a lot of surveys at rivers or places that are close to the source of the leakage. So in our investigations, we focus on two areas, what products are leaked and where they leaked from. These two areas are important for developing efficient solutions. The reason we used Albatos is that there were some issues with previous survey, survey methods. When sampling microplastics in water, 
The usual way is to put a net behind a boat, but boats are very expensive. And if a river or a channel is quite narrow, a boat cannot even enter. So we decided to develop a device that would be inexpensive and usable anywhere named Albatos. Albatos can be suspended from a bridge or a pier and the survey can be completed in just three minutes. Albatos has already been used in more than 300 locations in 10 countries, including in a project with UNEP's countermeasure, which was conducted in Mekong River Basin. It is quickly becoming one of the world's most widely used microplastic research devices. So after the plastic is collected, it has to be analyzed. By using FTIR and microscopes, we analyze parameters such as components, colors, sites, and shapes of the candidate plastic particles. Pirica works with works with universities and plastics processing companies to perform the analysis. So for example, around Mekong River Basin, the original product of microplastics were deduced from these samples. Also, our past surveys have shown that more than 20% of the microplastics that flow into Japanese rivers are fragments of artificial turf. Until we did our surveys, no one knew that artificial turf was such a major source of microplastics leakage. So after we discovered facts that could be inconvenient for related industries, in this case, artificial turf leakage, we start collaborations with related companies and begin developing solutions. For the case of artificial turf leakage, for example, we are creating guidelines about maintenance in order to reduce leakage and developing a filter for drains to stop leakage into water systems and recycling collected fragments into new products. Our research is leading to both the development of the solutions and the generation of new businesses. So our next challenge against plastic leakage are the following three steps. First, we need to continue investigating microplastic monitoring at rivers or near the source of leakage and identifying the source product of unknown microplastics. There is about half of unknown microplastics other than artificial turf, coated fertilizers, and styrofoam. We also need to consider low-cost countermeasures against obese leakage as we developed countermeasures against artificial turf. Second, we need to collaborate with stakeholders such as companies, local government, research institutions. Then, based on the above steps, we can develop concrete and socially acceptable solutions such as a new business for a company. So Pirica is growing. We are seeking to work with more companies and governments. If you are interested about microplastic survey using Albatos, please feel free to contact us. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Meg San, for, your, uh, for sharing a very concrete example about the countermeasure project, uh, highlighting the importance of uh, monitoring, uh, in particular at rivers or near the source of leakage, and uh, suggestion of techn technical solutions. Thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to uh, the final presentation by Dr. Perjan Bodandi. Uh, for, uh, so for, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening all. Um, I'd like to commence this presentation by thanking the Japanese and French embassies for giving me the opportunity to present on this important topic of marine plastic litter from ships. Now, um, being the last to present, um, uh, give me the um, 
uh, the opportunity to, to um, uh, base my presentation on what has been said by all intervenants so far in relation to the magnitude of the issue. So I'll, I'll go straight um, to the structure and point of this presentation. Um, now, the background of this presentation, my presentation is uh, limiting, and I'm limiting, limiting my analysis to the ship-based pollution and the role of the IMO as regulator for international shipping. So I'm not considering land-based uh, uh, plastic, microplastic. Now, uh, this presentation is going to be not so much descriptive, but more um, uh, analytical and perhaps a bit critical. Um, and the key message probably to retain from these presentations are twofold. The first one is that new issues, and, and as far as the aim is concerned, is that uh, new issues require time to deal uh, to be dealt with by the regulator in place. The second fold is that the solutions to new issues um, has to be uh, integrated into existing legal framework and work divisions of the IMO. And these are the two uh, challenges that the IMO is facing in relation to the regulation of uh, plastic marine debris. Now, um, essentially, now I will be uh, trying to demonstrate those two points through the analysis of the current legal framework and its practical dealings with marine plastic at the IMO. Now, the, uh, there's again two fold to this demonstration. The first uh, main challenge of the IMO is usually to deal with IMO procedural rules. Um, and here I'm referring to the issue of uh, the science based principle or approach versus the precautionary approach. Now, what you have to understand is that the IMO has adopted the science-based approach, which consists in saying that the IMO can only make a decision until it has scientific evidence that such a decision or measure is justified. Now, there is nothing in the IMO status that requires this approach. This is something that uh, the IMO has transplanted or adopted from uh, the WTO uh, as far as the uh, uh, SPS or, or TBT agreement are concerned. Now, if you uh, put the science-based approach uh, and you post that to the precautionary approach that says uh, basically that you do not need to wait until you have scientific evidence before you, make a, uh, you take a, a measure, clearly the two uh, principles will collide. And so the IMO has to uh, grasp with this because the precautionary approach is usually the approach uh, adopted in relation to the protection of the environment. Uh, there is a third fall uh, in relation to the third uh, subpart to the, in relation to the IMO procedural issues, which is the impact assessment. When we talk about impact assessment, usually we refer to the environmental impact assessment. However, there is, and, and this needs to be done, uh, but however, these days the IMO is also engaging into what we call regulatory impact assessment. In other words, the IMO is engaging into a process by which it's trying to assess the economic impact of the measures that it might take to protect the environment. So this all uh, take time. Um, the IMO substanti substantive rule are also an issue and explain the delay and the difficulties in, in, in dealing with the uh, marine plastic litter. Uh, this is due to the fact that everything is partitioned, the issue and the response are partitioned in relation to uh, committees and subcommittees at the IMO and also in relation to applicable convention and rules. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about the way forward. So these um, three next slides are just to exemplify uh, the substantive issue. And so um, on the left here, you can see the, the process that the AMO usually has to follow before it can lead to an adoption. So you, you have to uh, allocate the work, you have to uh, look for scientific evidence, develop a strategy, gathering a consensus and so on. Uh, this is exam exemplified here, for instance, in relation to the work uh, for the amendment of Annex 5 of MAPOL, which is the convention that deals with the maritime pollution. And you can see the various steps that uh, already Already have taken place in relation to trying to regulate marine plastic. And um, uh, uh, if you look at, for instance, the action plan that was proposed by Vanuatu, you can see that various um, uh, committees and subcommittees or conventions were involved, such as MAPOL, uh, Port uh, State, the STC Convention, which is the standing and, and crew wash keeping, um, and so on. So each time that requires uh, a cross or intra uh, organization and uh, cross uh, organization collaboration. The same can be uh, seen in relation to a sub issue of marine plastic litter, which is the, um, uh, the uh, um, 
fishing gears um, that can be abandoned. So the uh, solution would be to tag uh, fishing gears and, and it, fishing gears constitute a large amount of uh, marine plastic debris. That work also has to go through the same process and involve various subcommittee of the IMO. Uh, again, we have also a sub issue with the container uh, lost at sea. And here you can see that this involves various um, IMO conventions, such as the Marpol Convention on the one hand, the SOLAS Convention on the other hand, um, the Nairobi Convention on Rape Removal, and the IMO um, work is trying to coordinate all this work. And so each time that you have a, a different convention uh, that is uh, that the IMO is responsible for, you have different committees and differ, different work stream to organize. So uh, in short, the way forward is that um, basically there is a need for uh, cross-sectoral and intra-multi-agency cooperation with a high level of engagement uh, in a very short of time. And this is obviously the, one of the main challenge. Um, uh, I thank you all. I get to go say Merci. Thank you, Thomas. Inakavakalevu. Malo. Uh, thank you, uh, Pierre Jean, uh, for sharing about uh, regulations about ship based marine plastic pollution and highlighting the importance of governance to take, tackle the plastic pollution. So, uh, having heard from all of you, uh, now we have a good understanding of the marine plastic pollution uh, we are currently facing and some of the solutions. And But the problems with marine plastic pollution is evolving, and I would like to ask panelists for your insights on new or emerging challenges about marine plastic pollution, if any. I would like to start uh, with Claire in the order of the presentation. Because of the time constraints, please make your comments within two minutes or so. Thank you. So Claire, please. Well, I, I think the, the main issue will be, and for, for, for many questions like that, the commitments of the, of the governments, not only the international commitment, but what, will, what the governments will put into action to tackle uh, microplastics and, and plastic pollution. So this is a question of real involvement and engagement of the states, I believe. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, then, uh, uh, Sadar from OECD. Yes, thanks for your question. I think one uh, key challenge that has received less attention is what's happening in our rivers. And we have given, uh, we are give, starting to give a lot of attention to the oceans, but what's happening on the surface of the rivers and on the river beds and lake beds also needs to be uh, looked at seriously because that's a key part of the problem. Okay, thank you for your comments. So, uh, Megsan, uh, I'd like to have also have your comments. You are also uh, fo uh, focusing uh, on the issue of rivers. Yes, uh, thank you for a question. And uh, there are still uh, microplastic estimated product which is not uh, which is not uh, unknown. So. Uh, we need to identify the source products of unknown microplastics, and we need to know uh, what products or source can be fragmented and be linked into the environment, uh, especially in river or near the uh, near 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 river. So, after funded, what product can be microplastic? Uh, we need to suggest more concrete and more socially acceptable and low cost solutions as we develop the solutions against artificial tap. So that's all, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, uh, finally, I would like to ask Pierre Jean, uh, what is the uh, emerging issue, challenges? Um, emerging challenges, uh, I, I think is, is the, the one, uh, all described by, by uh, uh, my colleague. Um, 
uh, regulations is, is a big challenge, but I think as for any negative externality, because pollution is a negative externality uh, in, in a classic uh, economic approach and, and market approach, uh, basically uh, pollution needs to be taxed and, and so the polluters has, has to, to, to pay. So uh, I think ahead of pollution, what needs to happen is really enforcement of um, some taxation for, for polluting the environment that would probably cave the the uh, pollution and, and, the, and the amount of, of plastic produced. Now, there are areas where uh, plastic cannot be replaced. And for instance, I'm thinking about uh, fishing nets. And so for that, then there is a need for specific regulations, but maybe a, a new instrument independent from the rest also could, could help. Um, so various folds, various approach should be contemplated. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. And uh, so uh, I, I... I could hear the comments on the emerging challenges uh, from the four speakers. So based on that, I would like to move to the second question. Uh, the, considering the magnitude and complexity of the marine plastic pollution problems uh, mentioned, uh, maybe one entry or one sector or one country alone cannot solve the problem. So I would like to ask the panelists, what kind of cooperation or collaboration, including regional cooperation uh, or, uh, is needed. Also, I believe the audience today come from different sectors. So what are the roles of different stakeholders such as the UN organization uh, or governments, local governments, businesses or uh, citizens, uh, individuals? Uh, what kind of uh, collaboration and the role of different stakeholders. So I, I would like to start this question uh, from P Pierre Jan uh, in the reverse order of your presentations. Um, it is true that the collaboration interagency and, and um, uh, intra-agencies is always uh, uh, difficult, but I think they are developing initiatives uh, that, that promotes addressing the, you know, this type of issues. So I think we, we need to foster that as I think uh, the presenter from the OECD just, uh, just mentioned, this, this trend needs to, be, uh, needs to be encouraged. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Amenza, please. Yes, uh, maybe I will talk as a company or a research institution. So what uh, regional occupation is needed? Uh, we need to collaborate with uh, related other companies by suggesting countermeasures at their new business. And for example, artificial turf leakage. So maybe it can be inconvenient for companies which produce art artificial turf or companies which construct sports facilities. But instead of putting pressure on them, I think uh, we can lead them to a positive solution by creating a case study of countermeasures with corporate innovators. So that's all, thank you. Oh, thank you very much for your comments. Now, uh, Dr. Sorry, uh, Dr. Shada, please. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, I, I would just highlight three things. Uh, we need coordination uh, among governments to harmonize regulations, for example, on product standards and so on for plastic products. Second, we need financing for which development cooperation agencies, but also the private sector and local governments have to play an important role uh, to have better financing for waste management, which is a key source for plastic leakage uh, to begin with. And finally, we need collaboration among private sector actors to take the lead on innovation. Okay, thank you very much for your very comprehensive comments on this issue. So finally, I'd like to ask Claire Sam to, uh, to respond to this question. Thank you very much for the question. I think <laughs> everything has been said before and I agree <laughs> with the, the part on innovation. I think it's very, it's crucial to, to for the future of, of microplastic. And as well, uh, I think that there are many initiatives um, held by, by citizens or uh, NGOs, and it's probably very important to have uh, that kind of experience in mind to, to uh, maybe scale up these initiatives at, uh, at a national level to, to show examples of, of um, good lessons 
And but but the part on innovation, I agree, is very crucial. And to know what is uh, really pollutant, like we saw the artificial artificial turf, then stop the use of things like that would be would be a a, a great thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire, for your comments. So uh, we have a. a very uh, limited time, but a very good discussion. So, and actually, I have we have already received uh, many questions, uh, more than I, I had expected. So, but 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 the time, uh, because of the time limitation, we cannot answer all the questions. So, I would like to pick up one uh, most important maybe question on uh, relating to the uh, negotiation of, of the of the future international legally binding framework. So, uh, sorry. So there's a question on what is the perspective of the of the uh, this legal uh, this what is the uh, outlook of the international discussions uh, for legally binding framework? How would it establish agreement, the obligation, the burden of social costs for companies in plastic created industries, especially? production companies like the carbonization framework in COP26, including loss and damage. So it's a, a little bit uh, uh, very uh, complex issue, but I'd like to have a comments from the each panelist on this, on your perspective uh, on this issue, uh, relating the international discussion on uh, legally binding framework. So maybe I'd like to start from uh, Pierjan, please. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kenshi, for, for this question. Uh, I was just typing that this is an excellent question, but it is, it is a, a very complex and, and long question, and, and it would require a fair bit of time uh, to really uh, fully address. There, there are uh, pieces and bits uh, here or there tackling part of the issue, but not really an overall uh, agreement uh, dealing with that. And, and you know, uh, the decarbonization, you're absolutely right, it is a topic that is uh, closely related, at least as far as the AMO is concerned, uh, because of the nature of the challenge and the different type of, of uh, agreement that need to be to be linked together. So uh, the last bit about loss and damage, this is, this is a very, very complicated and sensitive topic in, in international environment law, as, as you might know. And so I think before we can see something tangible, okay, Occurring on, on the loss and damage front in relation to microplastic, it would it would take some time, unless there is political will, uh, obviously. I hope that answers most Thank of it. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Nick Sang, uh, could you please make some comments on the international discussion uh, on uh, legally binding framework? Yeah, uh, for me, it's also very <laughs> difficult to answer. Uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, plastic related industries, um, maybe it's uh, difficult to, to, pre to do pressure to them, but uh, uh, we or research institutions or uh, local governments can, local governments or governments can be, um, uh, can be, can be have can have obligation a part of the burden of the social goals. So so maybe I think we need to collaborate uh, with them. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Then uh, I would like to ask uh, Shadow San uh, for your comments. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's it's a very key question, but I think it's a bit difficult to answer right now because the call to start the negotiations has just been made at UNEA. We haven't started the negotiation process. Yeah. So it may be a bit premature to uh, flesh out in concrete details what this would mean. I think we have to see how the process unfolds over the next year, or next two years, actually. Okay, thank you very much for, for your very cautious comments on this issue. Thank you. Uh, finally, I'd like to ask Kriya San for your comments on the uh, legally binding framework. It is also, you also mentioned, uh, attacked upon this issue in your presentation also. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I agree, it, it is a bit soon to say what will be involved into the, into the agreement, but what we can say it's um, under the umbrella of the, the One Health approach probably, and, and the collaboration between um, UN institution is, is crucial like to know the impact on health uh, of plastics uh, is important because if the citizens uh, themselves are, are pressuring on an action of the governments, probably uh, because they feel completely lost and, uh, and myself as a citizen, when I, I am thinking about not using plastic, but what can we do? Then if we, if we do a collective pressure on governments to, to stop the use of uh, single use plastic, probably, it's a way also to, to stop the, or to reduce the production of plastic. So I guess it's a way uh, also um, from, from the citizens to, to, to put pressure uh, even internationally to, to, to have an action at the international level. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a little bit time, so I direct one more question. Uh, I think there's a question on the uh, how we can uh, sorry uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to find the question. Uh, okay. So I would like to there's one specific question uh, relating to the One Health approach. So I'd like to uh, ask this question to Kriya-san. Uh, uh, the collecting garbage tends to be informal work in developing countries. And I saw street children collect, collected plastic bottles to slum area, which is near muddy ground. So how do you improve this kind of situation towards your beautiful waste management and recycling circulation with uh, these people, health, one health illustration. I don't know how to re reply shortly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> thank you for the question, but uh, that's for sure that th there are different levels of decision making here. Uh, there is a one health framework interesting to consider the health of all, but probably what the, the action at the at the very local level is very important when it comes to to garbage and to to such um, uh, the involvement of, of of children collecting plastic, for example. What can be done at the local level and 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 the use of of plastic there uh, is probably an action at the local level. While there is also that 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 international. Uh, commitment. So it also depends on on the kind of um, of leg national legislation or local power uh, on what to do at the at the local level. I'm not sure to be to to, to be able to reply in a very short way. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for answering this very difficult questions. Uh, so I have uh, another two minutes. So I would like to pick up one more question. Uh, this is a question. Uh, how much have you found out the situation in deep ocean? So who is the, uh, have uh, expertise on to discuss the situation in deep ocean? Korea san or? Well, uh, I, I don't know from from what I understand from the question the 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 question the um, I don't know myself about the plastic in deep ocean. What I know is uh, there are scientists working on that, and and I I have shown two examples of articles on microplastics in marine mammals, for instance, and we can identify the the. Um, if the marine mammals are coming from the from the deep sea or are traveling a lot, so it can give indication on on the um, 
the origin or, or the way the, the microplastics are traveling, if we can say so, but uh, I'm not sure it was exactly the question. Sorry, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any comments from the panelists on this issue of the deep ocean? Okay, so uh, now I have to uh, close the discussion of, uh, because the, uh, the time is comes. comes so, and I also like to thank the, our panelists. Uh, some of the uh, questions have been already uh, answered by in writing. So, uh, I'd like to invite the audience to refer to the uh, Q and A box, uh, writing uh, response in writing. So, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for your very active uh, discussions. And I would like to return the microphone to the to Ericsson, MC, uh, for uh, for your management. Uh, you have the floor, so please. Thank you so much, uh, Takahashi Shicho, and thank you so much, uh, esteemed panel. I think this was a really rich exchange, and it's reflected in the fact that I think we've set a new record for sixteen uh, questions. Uh, and I would like to encourage the panelists to, uh, if they have time and uh, the appropriate knowledge, to keep on responding to those questions in the question and answer box. Uh, at this point in our session, we're going to uh, move over to um, uh, some additional uh, concluding remarks from Professor Tamarat Kutatep. And uh, Professor Tamarat is uh, at the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate uh, School of Environment, uh, Resource and Development at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok. And uh, Professor Tamarat, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, um, introduction. So I'd like to share a few slides that to conclude this uh, session, which is uh, very, very impressive. I also have learned from the, the four panelists that are having a very good uh, presentation of the, the issues of the, the technologies, of the, the governance, also together with that, uh, the challenging um, uh, impacts to the, the oceans and together with uh, the microplastics. I think I'd like to conclude by briefly uh, review that uh, this uh, four session, this four presentation, we have learned from the ocean microplastics and uh, in particular to that, the one health approach. And together with that, we have learned about the, the, the plastic issues uh, in the ocean, the global plastics. And together with that, the technique, the technology is how we can monitor and survey appropriately. And so called that, uh, the governance issue that uh, in particular to the, the marine plastic eaters from the chips. So a brief summary, if I try to recall uh, for two of you that I try to highlight that one of the interesting one health at the ocean is that we need to address the issue of the microplastics, not just only means of that uh, tackle the plastic reduction, but we need to think about the interdisciplinary, not only the way of the technologies, but many other in also the intersectoral, I think uh, Claire, mentioned nicely that with the, the full life cycle approach, this is very important. We have to base on the scientific data and try to think about that, how we can measure, how we can uh, think about the, the, the mitigations and also the reduction of the pollution into the oceans. I think that's very, very important. Then the second issue, I think very, very interestingly that uh, this kind of a graphical presentation to talk about that, the plastic waste, the leakage into the environment, and then the, the microplastic leakage, we found out uh, almost 3 million tons, and the key pathway is about from the aquatic leakage. So that at least, uh, this is a very, very alarming point that we need to think about that how we can prevent, otherwise if it is leaking into the oceans, it will be very, very difficult to recover at least the protection to the, the, the coastal area. I think that's very important. So we have learned from this uh, OECD, I think many more informative um, data will be described in that uh, the outlook that I think they can download, right, uh, uh, from the OECD. The other one is about that the technologies, apart from those the conventional uh, searching for the technologies, but 
the innovation, innovative equipments like this would be interesting for us that we can welcome many others uh, sampling device that how we can collect appropriately the plastic, in particular to the microplastics, which is somehow now today we are talking about the nano plastic as well. So that the nano plastic, we are found out that right now that uh, you may have, have heard about uh, the new findings that uh, micro and nano plastics we found in our blood. So that it would be very important that well, uh, if it is going to uh, the, the food chains like that, back to the human blood, how can we know that? And I think that uh, that more and more advancement in terms of the technology for the monitoring for the survey, we are much needed on that. Then last but not the least is about that. Uh, the, I think it's very important pass on the international agreement uh, negotiation, this kind of uh, damage. Uh, not only from the, the Vanuatu or the Pacific Island country. I think that recently the Sri Lanka also facing a huge form of this kind of uh, the damage of the, the, the uh, chips that contribute to the macro, na, na, micro plastics into the ocean and then cause a lot of damage to the, the public, to the societies. So that would be a much needed to think about that, what and how we can consolidate this kind of uh, international agreement and then raise the uh, issues to all the countries that you need to adopt and adapt this kind of uh, uh, international uh, uh, agreements and also the legislative framework into our own countries. Then uh, I just like to highlight to you that we can find many, many other challenges and also that the future depends. So we need the international, local, original governance. We need more effective management system, as in particular to the plastic eaters, we may not be able to collect all the microplastics, but, but the most simple way is that we have to prevent the macroplastic to, be, uh, to become uh, uh, meso, uh, micro or nanoplastics, so that we can reduce that. With that, we can think about the circular economy, apply the circular economy, that uh, we can use more uh, circular economy concept to prevent the pollution, and then with that, I try to highlight to all of you uh, with this uh, uh, session that we have about 120 people discussion in the, 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 the session. But if you think about that, just simply multiply by another 100. If you may know that the other 100 people may impress or may have the expertise on the plastics, it may have about that only about 12,000 people. But 12,000 people to tackle uh, 200 million tons of the plastic may not be enough. So that I would like to call for that the capacity and capability development, in including that innovation, technology, and human resources is very much needed with the new expertise. And also that I would hope that we can transfer the pollution control. It's not only the, the sake of the government's municipality to do that, but it should transform into the businesses that we can ensure they would have the sustainable activities so AIT, we developed the money plastic development program with the support of the Japanese government, try to highlight this, that, that to build more, to uh, uh, leverage more people, uh, the, the, the young generation that, hey, you should know uh, this issue in particular to the marine plastics. How should we do that? Not only the technology, but also with that, um, the circular economy, with the leaderships, with the um, the business management, how we can develop uh, uh, technology out of that. So I think that would be the, the thing that i like to highlight from this interesting discussion and also presentation by the panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Tamara, for that uh, very nice uh, summary of uh, some of the issues that were discussed and also highlighting the role that uh, AIT is playing in this space and the, the efforts to try to develop uh, graduate studies around some of this work and threading in some of the uh, interest in circular economy. Uh, once again, we've had a very, very rich exchange and to uh, bring us to a close, I'd like to now turn the microphone back over to the executive director of I just, uh, Mr. Yasuho Takahashi, and uh, Takahashi should show the floor is yours. Okay, thank you uh, for your introduction. I'd like to make a very short concluding remarks for today's discussion. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the distinguished panelists for the valuable inputs and insightful comments from very broad uh, perspective. And also I'd like to, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank Professor uh, Tamarat for your excellent summary 
and the elaboration of the discussion today. Uh, we heard uh, the importance of looking at the entire life cycle of plastics to tackle this problem today, uh, because many stakeholders uh, involved in this in the life cycle of the of plastics, uh, cooperation, collaboration across the region and the globe, and among different stakeholders, will be critical in solving the problem. Uh, we heard we heard of the importance of uh, not just technical solutions but also the role of policies and the regulations as well as uh, systemic change and then also the importance of uh, public awareness and uh, capacity building. Uh, one health concept also tells us uh, that successfully tackling this problem may lead to not just a better environment but also better human health. Finally, I would like to thank the organizers of the, the of this uh, very timely event as well as the uh, participants more than 100 participants uh, for making this session interactive and insightful. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, everybody. And I just want to highlight that the video of this will be posted on YouTube and available through the IGES website. And thank you again for attending today's side event. Have a nice evening. <laughs>